So, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name's Dale Schmidt. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the National Aquarium. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening's lecture. It's part of the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series and uh, Change Makers Making Conservation Personal. Throughout this series, we're honored to feature individuals who devoted themselves to creating positive change, whether it's to address climate change, uh, improve ocean and animal health, which is near and dear to our heart, and to build diversity in conservation space. We believe their stories offer insights and inspiration at a local, regional, and international level. The Aquarium has had the pleasure of hosting the Marjorie Lynn Bank Lecture Series for more than 15 years. Thanks to the generosity of the Bank family. As many of you know, Marjorie was a photojournalist environmentalist, diver, and explorer. When she passed away in 1994, her family endowed the lecture series in her honor and has been very gratifying for the aquarium to be able to play a part in sharing Marjorie's love of the ocean and her sense of adventure with people like yourselves. In addition to recognizing the Bank family, I'd also like to take the opportunity to recognize the members and donors that make so many things for us possible. Thank you so much. I'd also like to acknowledge aquarium staff and volunteers. It's an amazing group of people. We got some right here in the youth group. Thanks for coming. And it makes me proud to be a part of that. It's an amazing group. And if you had ever thought of volunteering, I highly encourage you to consider coming here. Quick housekeeping note. Um, if you submitted your questions online, we have them. Thank you very much. If you didn't, there's still a chance. We're going to hand out uh, note cards toward the end, and you can write your questions for the question and answer uh, period. We'll collect those. And uh, in fact, unfortunately, um, I won't be able to stay for the whole uh, series or the whole evening. Um, I am uh, triple booked, I think. But um, Jenny Jansen, who is our assistant curator for Blue Wonders, who makes certain everything you saw over here that includes the sharks is well taken care of, and she will uh, do a much better job than I would. So thank you, Jenny, for filling in there. This evening, we're delighted to welcome Bill Band. He's going to share his beautiful photographs of sharks along with his experiences in diving among these amazing creatures. Bill has had a lifelong interest in sharks, Recent years, he's become more active in the conservation space because he's growing. He has a growing concern for their future, as do we. If you can get him to tell you some of the pilot stories, I would encourage that too. Those are fascinating too. He was one of the first volunteer divers here in 1981 when we opened, and he's got some great stories about that also. He learned diving from his father in one of the coolest places to dive, the Philippines, in the 1960s. In fact, he's, he's been a certified scuba diver for almost 50 years. He graduated from SUNY Maritime College, and he's been a bay pilot, or was a bay pilot for 41 years, safely guiding ships in the Chesapeake Bay for the Port of Baltimore. Since retiring, he sought opportunities to dive with sharks all over the world. He's an avid photographer and he began recording the beauty of the undersea for his family and friends, and we're lucky enough to have him share that with us tonight. His art is raising awareness of the global plight of sharks, predators, and peril. Mr. Bland. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you very much. It's one of these things when you're a little shorter than most people, you're always uh, thanks for your being here tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, as Dale said, um, I've always been interested in, in diving, uh, and particularly as of late with sharks. Uh, I remember when I was uh, much younger, I was always afraid that I might see a shark, and then I never saw a shark, and, I, and then I wanted to see a shark. And what I discovered when the shark saw me, it was afraid of me, and it disappeared. And I. I, uh, so I started to look around for them, and uh, I know there's some divers out there. Uh, for most of us that are divers, a shark sighting is sort of like the highlight of the dive. It's, uh, uh, it's just an amazing sight to see. So in recent years, I, uh, I wanted to get to know these creatures a little bit better, and uh, I started, uh, as Dale said, 
uh, I started specifically looking for opportunities to dive with just sharks. And uh, it's been an amazing uh, thing for me. Uh, people often ask me, are you afraid? Are you scared? Or, you know, are you afraid of the sharks? What's it you're feeling? And uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not. Uh, in fact, I got a photograph here that was taken by a couple of my dive buddies. And I, I thought you would <laughs> just like to. Uh, uh, <laughs> so what? Uh, anyway, uh, so when I go in the water with sharks, I'm pretty focused on what the dive is, but I'm not really afraid. Uh, I tell people it's not like walking in front of a pride of lions. The sharks are very cautious around humans, and for good reason, as we'll see. Uh, I have been around hundreds of sharks, and uh, I've never had a situation where I thought I might get injured by them. Um, part of that is because I make sure that I'm in the company of other very capable divers. And uh, the other part is, is that the, the sharks are uh, very careful around us. Eye contact is very important. Um, uh, sharks are unsettled by that. Uh, bla uh, blonde hair, white hair, uh, bright yellow or bright green type things. You don't want to wear that uh, when you're with sharks. We generally dress in dark clothing, uh, wetsuit cap and that sort of thing. It keeps the sharks from being too attracted to us. Uh, I know that you all know some of this, but I thought I'd just run some of it by you. They're 400 million years old. They've been around for 150 million years before the dinosaurs. That's pretty impressive. They've survived five major extinction events. There are approximately 500 species of sharks and their distribution is global. Uh, some species can dive and live at depths in excess of 1,000 feet. Uh, shark skin is covered by tiny teeth called denticles and it feels kind of like sandpaper and I, I think if you first touch a shark's side, you, you think, boy, that must cause a lot of drag in the water, but in fact, it makes them all the more efficient. Uh, and in, indeed, the short fin mako, I'll show you a picture of one here later, their denticles are shaped even uh, more differently than other sharks, and they are the fastest sharks in, in the ocean and can hit speeds in excess of 40 miles an hour. Uh, skeletons are made of cartilage. Uh, they never enter a true state of sleep. The female sharks are larger than the males. And these sharks are anywhere from 8 inches to 40 feet in length. This is a uh, dwarf lantern shark. Uh, these sharks are found off the northwest coast of South America at depths in excess of 1,000 feet. And this is a whale shark, the largest fish in the ocean. They can reach lengths of 40 feet and be up to 10,000 pounds, uh, to up to 20,000 pounds, 10 tons. Sharks can live 20 to 30 years. Some species live a lot longer. In fact, the Greenland sharks, as you probably know, can live to be 400 years old. And I was reading not too long ago that they don't actually mate until they're like 150 years old. And I couldn't help but think to myself, like, what did the male shark think if the female shark at 150 suddenly told him that she had a headache that night? You know, I mean, I, I think about these things. It concerns me. I, uh, they have rows of teeth, as we know, that uh, as they break off from biting prey or whatever, they advance the, the teeth in the back, uh, keep pushing forward. Seven, five to seven gills. Uh, sharks do not breathe through their nostrils. The, those are strictly for smelling. Uh, the shark senses, uh, absolutely fascinating, that, and it reflects an animal that's been around for 400 million years. One part per million, uh, it's like taking a, an eyedropper of blood in an Olympic swimming pool, a shark can, uh, can find that. It's not to say that a shark would go after such a small bit of blood like that. It probably wouldn't be that interested, but a shark could find it. Uh, their sight is good, uh, particularly in low n light at nighttime. Hearing is good. Taste, they have tongues. Um, touch, obviously. The lateral line, which uh, just to make it simple, is kind of like a, a tube that runs down the sides of the shark and it can feel pressure, almost like an anemometer feels the wind. They can feel very slight 
pressure at some distance, maybe a fish struggling uh, off in the blue there, not too far away, but impressively so. And then the electrosensory part, which to me is probably the most fascinating thing, this ampullae de Lorenzini. The, these little dots here that you see are actually jelly-filled jelly uh, electrosensors. Uh, in 1678, Stefano uh, Lorenzini um, found on a torpedo ray these gelatin-filled holes, and he, he didn't know what it was for, of course, back then, but he knew that it had to be something significant on rays and sharks. It wasn't until 300 years later, like 1978, that scientists figured out that this enabled sharks to pick up electromagnetic signals and all of us have this in us, so a shark could pick up the electric s signature of prey in the water. Uh, nictitating membrane, on, this is a, uh, a tiger shark, and uh, this is a friend of mine, a professional shark diver, Josh. Um, he is stimulating the shark by rubbing its nose, but whenever a shark gets anything close to its eyes, in this case the tiger sharks, they have a membrane that will actually close over their eyes to protect. Uh, a great white's eyes will roll backwards to protect. If a seal is fighting for its life, they want to protect that. Uh, again, this is a, a tiger shark, and uh, there's that nictitating membrane right there. And these are a couple remora. Nurse sharks, uh, one of the few sharks in the oceans that doesn't have to keep swimming to breathe. They can pump water <laughs> through their gills and remain still, which is good because they're sort of a bottom feeding animal. Um, this is a nurse shark. I took this in Bimini. These uh, little barbells here help a nurse shark find prey under the sand. Uh, so it's another electro, more intensified electro sensing device. And they like to eat crustaceans and that sort of thing. Uh, these are tiger sharks. Um, I love this photograph, that's why I was showing it. I was really getting ready to take a picture of the first tiger shark here. I was getting my camera lined up when right behind it another tiger shark appeared and uh, I, it was one of the luckiest shots I've ever taken of uh, two tiger sharks at the same time. Uh, this uh, is a head-on view of a tiger shark. Uh, one thing that I'll also say while we're looking at this if you look at the shark here, you'll see that a shark's ability to see straight ahead is not that great. Um, the ampullae de Lorenzini are very helpful when it gets close to prey because it can't really see it at that point, but it can sense it with the ampullae. Um, tiger sharks, thresher sharks, and to some degree great white sharks are masters of navigation. A tiger shark could leave San Diego and swim to the Hawaiian Islands 3,000 miles in a relatively straight line. And there's no geographical reference, and scientists have wondered, how, how does that happen? How, do, how does a shark do that? Well, there's a, a determination now that this uh, ampullae can actually pick up the geographic poles, and the shark can actually navigate itself, which is a truly, truly amazing thing for the sharks. Uh, these are lemon sharks. Uh, they, this, uh, I took this uh, off of Jupiter, Florida. Uh, they generally like to hang out in, uh, in bunches, if you will. You'll find several or a number of uh, lemon sharks. They're a very powerful animal. Um, they're pretty diver friendly. They like to be around us and uh, we like to be around them to take pictures. Um, last uh, June I was uh, actually lining up to take the picture of one of these lemon sharks and another lemon shark came up behind me uh, and he came between my legs and my heels got hooked on its pectoral fins. <laughs> and as it was swimming along, I, I had uh, sort of a, a Pecos Bill experience on the back of this thing, uh, much to the enjoyment of my dive buddies. And uh, all, all I could think of is that I, it's too bad it wasn't a bull shark, I could join the rodeo circuit. You know, I just uh, wonderful animals. This is uh, Ryan Walton, another professional shark diver and friend of mine. Uh, here, uh, he again is doing this where th the shark is almost mesmerized by that nose contact and uh, 
you've probably seen film where people can steer them around. It's quite fascinating. So what I have right here is a, a little video that my son filmed that on a dive he and I made uh, in 2017 uh, with tiger sharks and lemon sharks uh, to put to music. And uh, I thought you might be interested to see how close it is that we actually get to these animals. It's about a three-minute video, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, Jim, could we turn the lights down a little? And three minutes, but I hope you like it.
There it is. <laughs> so you, you probably saw the, uh, the shark bite a camera. Um, I found that when the strobe lights recycle, that high-pitched sound usually bring the sharks over. Uh, you may have also noticed that when Josh was rubbing the shark's nose that it, it got sort of disoriented. You could see it sort of shaking its head around. Um, it's fascinating that uh, it has that sort of an effect touching their noses. Um, this uh, is a lemon shark going over my shoulder. She just uh, happened to have her mouth open, but uh, it was pretty impressive anyway. <laughs> Uh, white tip reef sharks, um, see a lot of these diving in the South Pacific. Uh, this is another shark that can sit on the bottom and pump water uh, through its gills to breathe. In the daytime, uh, it's not uncommon to find a few of them or a half a dozen or more under ledges uh, of coral or whatever. At nighttime, I've made night dives when these sharks are on the hunt and uh, they are like the gangs of New, New York. They uh, <laughs> they, they are nocturnal hunters and they'll go through a reef uh, in a very frightening way. Uh, they're not interested in us at all. It's just uh, they terrorize the rest of the reef for sure. Uh, this is a shiver of sharks. That's uh, what I learned that you call them. These are scalloped hammered heads. Um, this is a, a dive that I made in the Galapagos. The photographer here was uh, Mike Eversmere who lives out in Cockeysville. Um, so th there might be several hundred of these sharks swimming in large groups. The females are usually in the middle, and the males who are flirting with the females hoping to be chosen are on the out outskirts of, of uh, this mass of sharks. Um, just a quick story about those. We, we made that dive with the scalloped hammerheads, and that night we anchored uh, about 250 yards away from where we saw that, and we did a night dive to go see a, a red-lipped batfish, which I, I thought it was like a snipe hunt, you know, and, and uh, it was down at 90 feet, and uh, I wanted to see this thing. We got down there, and I, I, we did not see a thing. As we played our flashlights through the blue, nothing was moving, and it was really creepy, as I thought to myself, gosh, I, we saw about 200 sharks this afternoon, and we're only like quarter of a mile away from where they, we never saw a thing. It was just sort of a creepy experience. Uh, bull sharks. Um, these are probably the sharks that are responsible for most shark attacks throughout the world. The reason being is that they are estuary sharks. They can swim in fresh water. To give you some appreciation of how far up a river these sharks might swim, there have been bull sharks that have been found as far north as Illinois up the Mississippi River which is close to 700 miles up the Mississippi River. And indeed, there are bull sharks in the Chesapeake here also. Um, I Usually when we uh, dive with them, uh, the water might be 180 feet deep. We'll go down to 100 feet, and uh, they'll be below us. And it seems like they'll send one sentinel up to like see who we are and what we're all about. And once that animal determines that we're okay, the others will come up. And I've been in the water with as many as 13 of them swimming around us at the same time. And I never felt, again, threatened. So having said that, uh, this uh, is a photograph that I took uh, last June. And um, this bull shark, she was swimming by me. And I was trying to move close enough to get a photograph of her without thinking that the two divers on the other side might make her feel trapped. And so as I moved into her, um, this is classic aggressive posture, arched back, pectoral fins down, and she was basically saying, that's close enough, buddy. And uh, I, I read her message very clearly, and I, I stopped and backed away, and she went on about her business. Uh, this is a blue shark. I was diving off of Rhode Island uh, in August. Uh, these are threatened from overfishing. I just wanted to show you that. Um, and uh, they let us get pretty close to them. Isla Guadalupe is uh, an island about 200 miles southwest of Ensenada, Mexico. Uh, there's a huge amount of seals that are on this island in the middle. And there are, is also quite a large number of great white sharks. Um, this is the only time I've ever been in a cage and uh, it was required, and I, uh, I had no problem with it because there were, we, we saw, I think, 25 different great whites on this. Um, I also discovered that uh, uh, that old axiom, you're not in a zoo, 
uh, held true to me. And three days of diving, I spent almost 18 hours underwater, and I never got a shark to come close enough to get that real close, great white look. Um, I spent so much time uh, underwater that the crew would come out and say, Bill, do you want to get something to eat? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not here for food. I'm here for diving. And they started calling me Barnacle Bill on there. I just, uh, so. But anyway, these are a couple of shots of great whites and uh, they're beautiful, beautiful animals. Uh, this was a bait ball, a bunch of fish in a ball, and this great white um, kind of broke the ball up as she was swimming along, and it's very, very cool. Um, great white. Uh, this was the largest of the sharks that I saw. She was probably about 15 feet long and 2,500 pounds. Uh, just an immense animal and just, just beautiful to look at. Shark bites. Um, when sharks mate, the male will often bite the female. And uh, this female, great white, was, you can see the, the teeth marks. Oops. You can see the, the teeth marks on her here. Um, pretty significant. Um, a friend of mine who's a, a marine biologist, uh, so it came from a woman, she said that female sharks, like women everywhere, have a thick skin. And, uh, and th they're able to survive these kind of wounds. In fact, they heal fairly rapidly. I was very impressed with some of the injuries I've seen on sharks over the years. And I see the same sharks months later and can't see uh, the damage. Uh, this, again, is a short fin mako, fastest shark in the ocean, member of the same family as the great whites. Um, uh, just beautiful animals. I'm going to dive with them uh, in February off of Mexico. This is probably my favorite shark, uh, the great hammerheads, uh, beautiful, beautiful sharks. Um, they look very threatening, uh, but they're actually pretty... Uh, nervous around humans. Uh, if you make any movements that are unexpected, a, a 12 or 13 foot hammerhead is out of there and you're probably not gonna see it again. <laughs> so you have to be very um, methodical in your movements around them. Uh, I love that radar array that they have uh, for their faces. They again are looking for stingrays and that, that shape of their head and helps enable them to detect prey under the sand. Um, I love to watch them swim in the water. Uh, probably of all of the sharks, they're some of the most maneuverable. Um, that dorsal fin that rides so high and their faces, their heads, are sort of like the wing on an airplane and uh, they can turn on a dime. It's, it's really, really impressive to watch. Um, photography, I just thought I'd throw a couple. I shot this over one of my friend's shoulders of a great hammerhead. This is in, uh, in February. Uh, this uh, is similar to what I'm shooting with, uh, this kind of a thing with the camera and the strobe lights and all of that business. Um, uh, it's very unwieldy out of the water, but once you're in, it's, it's not, it really doesn't get in your way. Uh, there's a camera hog in every bunch, and uh, this is a shark guy. She just wouldn't let me, she was very selfish about who might take, so I got stuck with her little grin down there. And I, uh, this is a photo that I'm just showing about complacency and situational awareness. I was trying to get a photograph of the shark in the middle, and uh, that night when I got home, I was going through my pictures, and uh, I showed this to Tammy, my wife, who's sitting back there, and uh, I noticed in the upper right-hand portion of uh, that, uh, and I never, I never saw that shark <laughs> at all. I was pretty zeroed in on this. That, I'm pretty sure, was a, uh, a lemon shark, but uh, it did teach me to be a little more cognizant of what's going on around me. So uh, we're starting to get into the more serious part of my talk. Uh, removing hooks uh, isn't uncommon. This is my friend Josh again. Here he had removed the seventh hook out of the, out of five sharks in one afternoon of diving. This was taken by another one of my diving uh, buddies, um, but Josh was removing hooks from the shark's mouths, who it, it requires somebody with the skill and experience of Josh to do that, but nevertheless, he was pulling these hooks out of their mouths. And usually when I'm diving with sharks, you'll almost always see maybe a quarter of them have lures or hooks in their mouths. It's really uh, upsetting to see. 
This is a shark with a gunshot wound in its head. Somebody shot it. Um, uh, this was taken off the coast of Florida. In Florida waters, you're not allowed to shoot um, sharks. Uh, we were more than three miles offshore, so I don't know where the shark was when it got shot. Um, I had seen this shark uh, some weeks after this happened, and she was recovering nicely. I, I was surprised from the look of the impact wound, um, but somebody just shot it. Uh, this is a bull shark that somebody hit with a shotgun. So the shark's vital role in the ecosystem is to main, maintain the structure in the food web. They consume prey species, so there are smaller fishes that are also predators, and the sharks are needed to keep those numbers down. They also influence prey behavior, which is to say that when a shark is in the water, those smaller predators are a lot more careful about going out on the reef to go pick off somebody if there's a a shark swimming around that's going to take care of them if they're not careful. So it holds down the slaughter that could happen without sharks. Um, and sometimes sharks are obviously prey for other species. Uh, shark benefits, the sharks have potential biomedical val value, appear to be a nat naturally immune to cancers. Um, and again, as it is in wildlife, sharks kill the ill and the weak, and only the strong survive, which helps future generations. Um, shark tourism generates more than $300 million around the world, and by tourism, I mean alive. The sharks are alive. Um, this, I actually shot this uh, in uh, February in Bimini, and this guy had a little operation going right here. He had a little shark cage and a scuba tank, and a tourist could come down on the dock, and these are bull sharks that are swimming around the cage, and he was throwing bits of fish in there. Well, I I'm standing on this dock here, and there were tourists standing around me, and they were throwing fish in the water. So the, the sharks had gotten to the point where anything that hit the water, they would go up right away. And what really shook me up is that there were small children of tourists running up and down this dock completely, there was no fence, there was no barricade, the kids were just running and I was thinking, oh my God, if one of them falls in, I, 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 I was so upset, I, I went back to the bar and had another beer, you know, I mean, it, grim, I'm telling you. So uh, as far as shark attacks goes, there, last year there were 88 unprovoked shark attacks, five of them fatal in 2017. Um, on average, there's 83 attacks uh, annually and six deaths. There are millions of people swimming around the world and six people are killed. And I know there's a sign somewhere in the aquarium here that says that 22 people are killed by cows every year, which I, I think is a good number. But here's another statistic that I looked up that I also thought was interesting, that in America alone, last year, there were 42,000 people that were attacked and bitten by other people. <laughs> so, you know, be careful about your neighbors, you know, I mean, what can I say? So uh, the odds of being attacked are one in 3.7 million, as struck by lightning is one in 79,000, drowning one in 1,134, getting killed in a car accident is one in 102, which uh, be careful driving home tonight. Uh, shark attacks and the mistaken identity, um, you can see in this uh, schematic how much a human on a surfboard looks like a turtle or a sea lion. Um, uh, I have found when I follow a shark attack that it almost never happens that a person is eaten by a shark. They're usually bitten. The shark realizes that this is not what I'm accustomed to eating, and they leave. Um, you rarely, rarely find that a shark has actually taken somebody and taken them off and consumed. It's usually a one bite and I'm gone kind of thing. Unfortunately, if the shark is big enough, the wound can be severe enough that the person would bleed out before they can get um, the aid that they would need. But uh, it's almost, in every case, uh, a case of mistaken identity. So now we get to shark finning. Um, uh, these are shark fins on, uh, on a fishing boat, probably somewhere uh, 
off of Ecuador or somewhere, or perhaps even in Indonesia. A hundred million sharks are killed annually, and of those hundred million sharks, approximately 75 million of those sharks are killed for fins, for shark fin soup for the Orient. There's no nutritional value in shark fins, and 75 million of those sharks are killed pretty much for that. That means that 10,000 sharks are killed every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, while I'm talking here right now, 10,000 sharks will have been killed uh, over the hour that, that I'm here. A lot of them are caught by long lining where maybe 40 miles a line is set out with interspersed hooks. They catch whatever they catch and, and bring it in. There's no real green peace protector for sharks uh, uh, globally. Uh, there's no global re regulation of shark populations. Uh, Shark reproduction is slow, depending on the type. Gestation can be uh, three months to two years. Sharks have uh, small litters, uh, and they also don't reach sexual maturity until they're about seven or 15 years old. The point of all of this is that the sharks can't keep up with this slaughter replacing themselves fast enough. This is uh, what long lining looks like. These are fins for shark fin soup. I think this is a photograph in Hong Kong. And these are getting ready to be exported to the mainland. Um, if you look to the left over here, that's not a mirror. Those are just more shark fins there drying in the sun for somebody's soup bowl. Another thing about sharks, when they fin them, that quite often they don't keep the shark's body. They just cut the fins off and drop the shark in the water. And without the ability to swim, to breathe, the shark essentially suffocates and dies like that on the bottom of the ocean floor. Hammerhead sharks, uh, uh, there's been a 50% a de decline in hammerhead sharks in the Atlantic Ocean over the past five years. Oceanic white tip sharks, which used to be the most prolific shark in the oceans, is down by 93%. I'm going to have the pleasure of diving with some of those in, uh, in April off of Cat Island. So without sharks, what happens in the oceans? There's a trickle-down effect. The mid-level predators flourish and they eat the smaller fish, um, particularly algae-eating fish. Their algae blooms adversely affecting the air we breathe, oxygen in the water, resulting in huge fish kills. Uh, myth and exaggeration, that book Jaws by Peter Benchley probably did more to hurt sharks than anything in history. And even Peter Benchley felt badly that he had written that book with what happened as a result. After, and while he was living, and afterwards, his wife uh, is a huge shark advocate to try to protect sharks. Um, also, um, this USS Indianapolis sinking um, is often used as an example of wholesale slaughter by sharks. The Indianapolis during World War II delivered the components for the, the atomic bomb for Hiroshima uh, to Tinian Island. And when the ship was coming back, it was on a secret mission. Nobody knew it was out there. It was torpedoed. Went down in 12 minutes. There were 1,200 men on the ship. 300 died immediately. And uh, the rest were cast a sea. Now, if you listen to Hollywood, they were all eaten by sharks. But the fact is, about 300 people survived. Most people died from exposure, lack of water, or their injuries. Maybe 50 or 100 people could have been taken by sharks. I assure you, I would not want to have been swimming in the water during that time. There were probably hundreds of, sh of oceanic white-tipped sharks. But the, the fact is, is that they didn't take everybody like Hollywood would have you believe. And while I'm on my little soapbox here, I'll also say that I have problems with Shark Week, who always dramatize all their episodes, they make it seem like the actor is doing something really dangerous. And those of us that dive with sharks regularly, and those of you out here that know something about sharks, you're thinking, what, are you kidding me? As Michael Phelps is seeing if he can swim faster, this or that, or, uh, um, you know, it's, it's silly stuff, and they like the hype so that we all view Shark Week. But I think a lot of Shark Week is shameful, and uh, it's upsetting for me to, to see some of the stuff that they put on. Anyway, uh, I'm getting close to the end here. These are shark conservation groups. I know that the aquarium has some that they would recommend. I highly recommend, 
advise you to, to get involved somehow. Uh, for me, I, I'm a little mom and pop operation. Uh, I've started talking to people because I think I can make a little bit of a difference by affecting people who don't know anything about sharks. Um, this first one here, American Shark Con Conservancy, uh, Hannah Med, um, she is down in Florida and she's doing a lot of research on hammerhead sharks that are catch and release and do they really survive the release and she's doing studies on that. I, I've, I'm in regular communication with Hannah. Um, she's also uh, from Maryland, which I like. Go Hannah. And, uh, and Fins Attached is uh, another interesting program. All of these uh, shark angels generally um, leans towards younger people. Predators in Peril it, uh, addresses sharks that aren't uh, the, the better known sharks that we all like to, to study about. Again, it's all about protection. So this is Snooty. And uh, Snooty has a deformed jaw that gives her this perpetual Disneyland smile. And uh, I always use her as my, my asset. She visits us frequently when we're diving off of Jupiter, Florida, and take her advice, save the sharks. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. They were just really beautiful pictures and great stories. Thank you. Yes, we love that. So for those of you who sent in your questions, and if you have any other questions, please jot them down. Um, we'll have a couple of people going around and uh, picking up any of your question cards, but we have a few questions that we would like to ask you, and sure. one of is in relation to what you were talking about with finning, has, do you, have we seen a noticeable difference in the reduction of finning since there's been more education and more awareness about it in recent years? Yes, I, I think, <coughs> I, I think that there has been a reduction, but not appreciable. And um, I was feeling very encouraged that, gosh, we're seeing a lot of information out there. And then a couple of weeks ago, I happened to read an article in, I believe it was the Sun Sentinel in Florida. And they actually found four hammerheads that had been finned off of Carey's Fort Reef, which is part of the Key Largo National uh, uh, Park in the Florida Keys. And this was like a month ago, and I, I was just jaw-droppingly stunned that it was so, sort of like somebody in your face had done this to some hammerheads. But that notwithstanding, I think public awareness is starting to uh, have it, its effect, and I, I do believe that, um, that things are going to get better. But I haven't seen a change like you would, you would think there that would That you be. would hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I've seen many of these the these huge, like almost fields of the fins laid out. I know that um, in recent years there have been some campaigns, mm -hmm. like even in China, like Yao, you know the yes. um, the basketball player, you know, where they're yes. sort of shunning the idea yes. of eating shark fin, which is yeah. that kind of thing has really yep. um, kind of been powerful. So yeah, and I do think that the Chinese are becoming more aware. I. Uh, a year or so ago, I was reading that a lot of Chinese thought these fins grew back, and they had no appreciation that these sharks were all dying. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of sad, especially from you know for those of us who are here and involved with the aquarium to see an animal, you know, go through that kind of thing. Yeah. In addition to just the impact on the planet, um, there was another question here, very different vein. Was how can somebody who's had a lifelong interest in sharks and marine life but has found themselves in the business world, make a career transition into shark advocacy and conservation? Well, in my case, I'm very fortunate because uh, I've spent my entire life on the water as a ship pilot and uh, as a diver. Um, to transition over to the sharks um, was pretty easy for me. Uh, I love everything about the water. I, I fancied myself to be an oceanographer uh, and just got sidestriped tracked in the, uh, into the shipping industry. I, I'll be very clear to tell you right off the bat, I'm not a scientist and uh, 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 I'm a lay person as far as knowledge about sharks like Jenny knows and whatnot, but uh, uh, it was an easy transition for me. I, I loved it. Occasionally I would see sharks from the ships and uh, it was always a thrill. So. One question that I have sort of related to that is, um, 
at the time that you got into photography and shark photography, was it was it film as your media? Yes. Yep. I was shooting with uh, Nikonos, uh, and uh, there's a, probably a couple people that n know those cameras, the film cameras. You know, you didn't know if you flooded your camera until a, a two hours of diving was <laughs> over, or whatever. You know, and you never knew. Uh, today with uh, digital, it just it really improves your odds of getting good photographs quite a bit. Yes, so I've I've been just an amateur, you know, tourist kind of photographer, but there's always, when you're using film, this idea of, I have to leave a certain number of shots for you're the right. way up. Absolutely, you yeah. are absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, so how has that been like freeing with the digital media? Or has it, have there been other aspects that are well, more challenging? Well, I mean, d to me, the actually, digital has made it a lot easier. Um, you can do test shots. Um, as I was saying earlier, you can, uh, what usually when I drop down, I'll find something that kind of might look like a shark, uh, even if it's another diver, and I'll take a shot of them, and I, I'll look at my camera to see what the exposure is, and I can make some adjustments before we actually have contact. And you can constantly keep referring. Uh, also, strobe light placement is very, very important when you're shooting anything, really. So, uh, I don't know if that's enough. Oh, but absolutely. <laughs> it's great. Um, <coughs> One question that I was also wondering was, in showing how um, you and your colleagues are removing hooks, what is the process for that, and like, what tools are you using? Are you, is it like your hands and needle nose pliers, or? Yeah. So I, um, as a photographer, I generally stay away from trying to okay. pull. A, uh, but in answer to your question, uh, Josh and Ryan and these other guys, uh, they will remove the shark by yeah. uh, the hooks by hand. But I, s um, so just but with a gloved hand, yeah, and just twisting and pull, twist it yeah. out. Um, I've, I have seen where we'll do a dive and there's a shark, a hook really embedded, and uh, Josh or Ryan or whoever will take a pair of needle nose pliers yeah. off on the next dive because quite often those sharks will just be there. Usually, if I'm diving in uh, Jupiter, we'll do three dives a day, and you might see the same sharks, and they'll take a pair of pliers down there yeah. and pull it out. Nice. And uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah, kudos to them for that. Because yeah. that is, you know, it's like when we go shark fishing, even on the uh, the aquarium's boat, you know, when we're removing hooks as we're, you know, tagging and releasing, it's still, you know, it's a bit of a chore to, you know, even when you're using circle hooks. Absolutely. And you've you've yeah. bent those barbs down so they come back out. Yeah. They just, it's still a bit of a wrangling yep. to get them it undone. Sure is. Yeah. 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 No, that's great work. Um. Can you tell us who were some of your heroes growing up? Yeah, I, uh, so it's interesting. I, my first reaction to that would be Jacques Cousteau, which uh, we all watched his films. And, uh, and of course, I loved Lloyd Bridges, who was a uh, sea hunt and everything. Sea hunt. But, but <laughs> when I thought about the most influential person to me was um, Stan Waterman, mm. who was an underwater cinematographer um, just a terrific guy. I never really got to meet him personally. His film work was great. I, I remember as a young person, there was a, a, f a, a film called Blue Water, White Death. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Gimbel, the son of the Gimbel family that owned all the, the uh, stores, uh, he put together this expedition. And Stan Waterman was one of the cinema photographers. And I just loved the guy. His, his connection with the people and the animals and... Uh, I saw him speak one time in uh, New Jersey, and that was as close as I ever got to him. But uh, he, of all of those people, I probably carried the most influence to me in my desire to record what I saw underwater. Yeah. Another question that we have here is, what is your favorite place to dive, and what would your next favorite thing to see be underwater? Uh... I would have to say my favorite place to dive was Palau. Mm. Um, it was uh, just an amazing experience. We, uh, uh, just as a sideline to that, uh, my wife's dad was in the first Marines and fought at Peleliu, and that was part of the Palau Islands. So uh, my brother-in-law and I went to Peleliu, and we spent three days walking through this untouched battlefield, which was uh, pretty remarkable in itself. But uh, Palau is a protected uh, area. The fish life was just incredible. It was marvelous to see. 
Um, probably next, I, I have not been to, I'd love to go to the Maldives. Um, I constantly hear that that is some of the most spectacular diving around. So I'd say first Palau, and then I'd like to go to the Maldives. Nice. I like, I like the future list. What else is on your short list? Um, well, again, uh, in February, I'm going to dive with uh, Blue Sharks and Makos off of Cabo San Lucas. Uh, and then April, I'm going off of Cat Island, which is one of the easternmost Bahamas islands, into real blue water to dive with the uh, oceanic white tip sharks. And I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be diving in water that's probably a mile deep. And these are really amazing, amazing sharks. Of all the sharks, they're, they're really, really cool. So when you're diving in blue water, like how deep are you going? Uh, usually we don't go beyond 100 feet. Quite often we're diving with nitrox, which is uh, oxygen enriched. So we stay at 100 feet or less, um, let the sharks come up to us. Uh, when I'm, a lot of my diving is off of Jupiter, Florida, and we usually drop in at about, the water's about 200 feet deep. Um, we'll settle out at 100 feet and let the sharks come up to us. They do. Um, so... Uh, but diving in that crystal clear, deep blue water, there's just something about that that's pretty amazing. I've never dove in blue water, and one day that would be very exciting. You'll like it. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so I'm watching this, and so my question in watching this, I was like, so do you need a photo assistant ever <laughs> for any of these expeditions? <laughs> You're not the ask. first one to ask me that. I <laughs> oh, I'm first in line. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, with regard to diving, and people again say about these shark dives, how dangerous is it? Well, I, I can honestly tell you that to me, the, the most unsettling thing at times is getting back in the dive boat if the weather's not good. It's easy to drop in, and then you have the experience with the sharks, and now you're carrying 20 pounds of camera gear and you're coming beside a, a rolling, pitching boat, and uh, the risk of getting clobbered, uh, it's, it, I'm probably more concerned about that diving than I am the animals around me. It's, uh, uh, so you have to be really careful getting back so in the boat. So true. Seeing that transom come and slamming down yeah. on the water is kind of terrifying, watching mm. the other people in front of you yeah. get on the boat. <laughs> right. so. Um, do you, so do you keep, like, a checklist, or do you have a count of how many different species of sharks you've dove with? Well, I I don't, but I, I will going forward, Jenny. Thank okay. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Someone I, else yeah, said that. <laughs> yeah. I, right uh, there, yeah. You know, I actually probably, you know, until I start to lose my mind as I get older, I, I, I which my wife would tell you I'm probably there already, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I pretty much remember the sharks <laughs> that I see. They're, and almost every experience is pretty novel. So. That's awesome. I love it. So did you, how did you get into photography? Well, I always uh, just had an interest in it. My, uh, my, my dad's mother was a professional photographer oh. in uh, New York in like the 1920s, which was pretty amazing for a woman to be doing that in New York. And, and I don't know if I genetically picked up something for her, from her, but I just liked taking pictures. And uh, uh, I found that I was getting to be pretty good at it. As a ship pilot, I photographed my work for about 30 years. Uh, I had a very interesting perspective of generally these ships, the bridge of a ship is about 100 feet above the water, and I had this glorious helicopter view of Chesapeake Bay. So I just started taking pictures, and I started to get pretty good at it. In the 1970s, I started taking underwater shots, and uh, the two just came together. I just really really enjoyed it and do today. Do you remember your first camera or have any special memories with that? Well, again, it was a Nikonis 3, and um, I probably flooded it three <laughs> times before I actually uh, got any photographs. I, uh, oh. I had some great shots of people taking shots of me emptying water out of my camera, you know. Oh, my gosh. But, but I started to get some good photographs, and uh, that, of course, kicks off, like, I can do better than that, and, you know. So now I have a huge investment in cameras. Uh, Tammy, oh, I once read an article about a guy that collected guns, and he didn't want his w wife to know how many guns he had, so he, found, he realized that if he left one gun 
empty in the gun cabinet. She always figured he only had that many guns, where he hid guns all around the house. Well, in my case, I've got cameras all over the, all hidden under this and that, and I'm hoping that my wife, Tammy, don't listen to this, but uh, <laughs> uh, I just, I constantly am getting camera gear, and <laughs> you know, I could open up my own Photoshop, I think, just uh, with this camera stuff that I have. It's a great hobby. It is. Nice. Um, so with, with your story about the, uh, the ecotourism there on the dock, but extrapolating on that, um, one of the questions is, do you, do you feel like with um, doing some of these cage diving and things like that, is there a negative effect to us feeding the, the sharks for those purposes? Yeah, you know, I was kind of hoping that that question would come up. Um, I, I think that there is some uh, merit to that argument. Um, for me personally, my argument is that I want to get the word out to the public and if I sit back and do nothing but say that people shouldn't be doing that, I'm not sitting here talking to you about sharks and the trouble that they're in. Um, I don't really think that it affects the sharks' behavior adversely. Um, I can tell you from my own personal experience diving in the Bahamas, uh, there are certain areas we'll drop in the water with no intention to feed sharks, and the sharks show up because they're expecting that that's going to happen. <laughs> by the same token, I haven't seen any aggressive behavior by those same animals, they, but they, they will come in. So uh, I, I guess I have sort of ambivalent feelings about it, but speaking for myself, uh, I have no qualms about getting in the, with them any time I can. Uh, and mostly because I, I want to talk about them and I want to show pictures to people that make people interested and rather than speaking from a distance. Uh, I also feel like having personal experience is a lot better than talking about something that somebody else did. I mean, I'm in there with these animals. I'm close enough to push them away with my hand or whatever. Uh, so f speaking for myself, I feel like what I do with the sharks is important. And the rest of it, I guess, you have to judge for yourselves. Yeah. So. And I, I totally agree with you as far as, um, as another person who is in the water, you know, with our animals, is being in with them, you're also your ability to be able to read their body language. Yes. You know, not just, you know, the, like, the, the aggressive pose right. or defensive pose, mm -hmm. but just in how they're swimming and where they're going and yes. their demeanor mm -hmm. in general that you're actually able to read that underwater yes. and sense. Yeah, and I also think that it's helpful to be a photographer because you are trying to approach these animals, so you're watching them very carefully and you're not doing something that will alarm them to flee from you. So you become an observer of their behaviors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so I, I think that that's a real asset to photography also. It like compounds the observational yes, skills. Yes, it does, yeah. yeah. So how, how old were you when you started scuba diving? Um, I was uh, 16 probably when okay. I was a actually scuba diving. Yeah. Initially with my dad, we were doing a lot of uh, skin, skin diving. diving. And then uh, 16 was the first time I ever put a scuba tank on. And, and what was that experience like going from skin amazing. diving? To okay. oh, it was amazing. I loved yeah. it. And we were talking earlier. Uh, about diving without a BC with Maggie. <coughs> uh, she was telling me about her, her dad, and I remember those days where we'd dive. We didn't have BCs. You just had the tank and a weight belt and hope you didn't have yourself overweighted too much, and, <laughs> and, and that, that's the way we dived. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm so happy that we have BCs now because <laughs> uh, th there was an element of risk about it that my youth uh, ignored, so. <laughs> We still do good. We still do that with a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> so, on a more serious note, um, what do you predict for the future of sharks and ocean con conservation? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think we have a chance, but uh, this global warming is a it's a huge issue that uh, I know probably everybody in this room is concerned about. Uh, I was asked to write an article about sharks um, uh, off of the Florida coast, and uh, people inevitably wonder about the black tip sharks. These aren't black tip reef sharks. These are black tip sharks that migrate from the Carolinas down off the coast of Florida, 
And New Smyrna Beach, Florida is like the shark attack uh, capital of the world where people get bitten by these sharks. These aren't big sharks. The wounds are never fatal, but nevertheless, people get bitten. At any given time, in the winter months, there might be 15,000 black tip sharks on the southeast coast of Florida um, hanging out like uh, the rest of us snowbirds do in the winter time. And uh, what they've noticed over the past couple of years is that those numbers have fallen dramatically because the seas are warmer. So whereas a, a couple years ago they had 15,000 of these sharks, I think last year they, wh however they do these counts, there were only like 4,000. And the rest of them stayed up off the Carolinas. Why? Because the water is still warmer. And uh, so anyway, we, we've got to pay attention to that. The plastics in the water, uh, pollution is affected. We, we all know this sitting here in this room. Uh, can we address it in time? I hope we can. Um, Enrique Sala, who spoke here some time ago, I loved his idea about protected areas around the globe, and we, we have to do more of that, I think. Um, so I, I think we have a chance, but we have to keep talking to each other and, uh, and really push this hard, become soldiers, not just observers. Now, in your travels, as you've gone from all these different dive sites, how how do you see those local communities in with the ecotourism or um, the different conservation yeah, mindedness? I, I think they really buy into <coughs> it, uh, at least in the diving community. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are very conscious of uh, the marine life and uh, the need to pr protect it. And I would say that's universal, that they, um, they, they get it. Yeah. They, they get it. Uh, whether the locals do or not, Part of it is their desperate situation. Um, shark finning, as example, if a guy from Ecuador can get 20 bucks for a shark fin and feed his family, he's not thinking much about conservation. And I can fully understand why. Uh, so globally, that is a, a problem. People, too many, too many of us in desperate situations. Yeah, it's, so. it's very mar much a whole, a whole market of, yes. of that commodity because yeah. You know, like you were showing in your photographs, you have the finning is taking place, and while that's a horrible practice, it's like the entire rest of the shark is left. Yeah. Which is, a, you know, potentially another food source Absolutely. when you come down to it. But Absolutely. the, you know, the yeah. lucrative nature of yeah. that pound per pound yes. just so outweighs the market. Yeah. And there is a, there is a, a thought process of, commercial fishing for sharks in a globally controlled way where the numbers are accounted for in a way that the sharks can reproduce themselves. And there are those that, and I don't necessarily disagree with it, uh, that feel that if, the, if controlling the shark population was worked in a fashion like that, that more countries would get on board with that concept of uh, monitoring the numbers of sharks and controlling so that we didn't lose all of them uh, if there was a commercial fishery that limited their catches. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so what would, what would you have us walk away with? Like what, what would you love to see us as everyday people to be able to walk away and do to help promote your message and your mission? Well, I, w I would say two things. Uh, the first one, is to tell people that the sharks aren't what everybody thinks that they are. <laughs> that they are wild animals, and surely they can hurt you, but they, they rarely do. Um, and number two, that they're 100 million a year being killed, and that they are very important to the whole ecosystem of the oceans, and indeed, at the end of the day, to us on, on Earth here. So those would be the two biggest things. Wonderful. I know it's um, as as you were describing that it it reminded me of your in your video where um, your colleague is rubbing the face of the uh, tiger shark and it and I had that moment where it was like that's what I do with my dog. <laughs> 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 well, you know, they're in some ways they're almost like that uh, if you know how to handle the the sharks that uh, they they uh, they like that sensation and they will come back repeatedly to get their nose rubbed and uh, and you can see that they're not approaching in a way that you're, they're going to tear you apart. They're coming up 
kind of like your dog. <laughs> they're not your dog. But, uh, but uh, they are not the animals that uh, people pretend they are, and particularly Hollywood. Do you, um, what are your thoughts of like shark tagging and that those kinds of research initiatives? Do you feel like those are beneficial to, to I, this story? I think they're helpful. Um, I was reading not too long ago that I think when they started tagging, uh, like 300,000 sharks have been tagged since 1962 or something like that. And only 20,000 of them have been recovered. But I still think that there's valuable information about migration and that sort of thing with it. Uh, also, uh, the satellite type stuff I think is pretty, pretty valuable. And another aspect about it is that if you can get online and follow um, Maggie the white shark, uh, 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 you know, <laughs> up and down the east coast of the United States, it makes you more interested in the sharks. And uh, uh, so I, I think that it's beneficial stuff. And I'm sure that scientists, uh, again, I'm not a scientist, uh, have much to gain from, from that. So. Yeah, I will, I will add, as you bring up satellite tags, there's actually um, some research that's going on right now, like in Delaware Bay, that the aquarium um, helps and collaborates with, where the satellite tags and uh, transceivers and receivers are, are attached to these sharks, and there are different um, receivers in different areas you know, in the ocean and in Delaware Bay, and as these sharks go by them, they ping. And so it tells you this individual who is measured at this length mm -hmm. and, and girth and sex and such and such, all those demographics for the shark are found in this spot at the same time as this one is in this spot and this one. And through that, they're, they're measuring the social networking mm -hmm. of these sharks out in the ocean, which is really kind of cool because you're it getting is. to see how many females are in the group, how many males are in the group, what is the time of year, and then you watch them as they go and they ping in the different locations and you can see how the groups diverge and how they separate and then come back together and who's hanging with who. And because of all the different taxa that people are tagging, so like different species of bony fish, you can also see the prey items that are traveling. So wow. there's some really cool stuff that going on with cool. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much thank you. for I sharing your time yeah. with us and this presentation. Um, I, thank you. I, I was a little concerned that Maggie was going to be standing on the side with the shepherd's staff and hauling me off the stage, but I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, in all honesty, I, I really enjoyed myself, and thank you uh, for listening and, and coming out on a crummy night like tonight. So it was really great to see you all, and thank, yeah. you, thank you very, very much. This has been it. wonderful. Um, are there any other last-minute questions that anybody wants to ask in front of the group? We do have the time. And if not, I have, you know, we, yes? Uh, the question is, how did I get to be the photographer that I am today? Um, and to be honest with you, I, 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 I don't know if I'd call myself a professional. Um, I, I put my, my pictures out there, and over the years, I have gotten photographs and calendars and magazines and that sort of thing, not uh, because it was my job, but because I happened to take some pretty good photographs. Um, but I, I, you can keep moving that forward, and... Uh, I don't know where I'm going right now with this. I, I've just started to speak to groups of people and I seem to be getting uh, some momentum building here. I, I don't know where it's taking me, but uh, if you're interested in photography, bring your camera with you wherever you go and shoot what you love. And, you know, it can take you places for sure. So I used to do a lot of whitewater kayaking and I ca would carry a a camera, a Nikonos film camera with me when I was paddling whitewater. And uh, my friends who were much better paddlers than I uh, would allow me to paddle with them. They'd say, oh, here comes a case of beer with Bill Band wrapped <laughs> around it. So I think the way they did. Um, but I, 
going with from there, I started to get photos <coughs> really published in a number of uh, kayaking venues, and uh, it again made me feel all the more enthused about taking pictures. Um, I study photographs. If I see a good photograph, I'll, I'll really take a look at it and try to figure out what the photographer did to get that shot. So um, that's also what I would pass along is look at pictures and if you see something you like, try to figure out how, how the heck did they take that photo. So. That's awesome. Um, in relating to that, um, and saying that you study photographs, I rem I'm remembering back, and you were talking about Stan Waterman being one of your sort of you know visionary people that you look to. I remember Ernie Brooks and his black and white photography mm -hmm. that he had, and I remember seeing some of those images when I was in college, and I was already, I was already you know like gung ho about sharks, and I, yeah. I've been a shark. Sharks were my first love, um, but. I saw those photo photographs, those black and whites, and they were just stunning. And I remember I had those up in my college college dorm room, and mm -hmm. they were sort of my inspiration yeah. as I was going through my undergrad. So yeah. that, you know, that ver that very much resonates with me is how you connect and where you go with that. I feel like your question though is, uh, I'm wondering more. It's like from going from, you have your progression of your ph photographic experience, mm -hmm. but then how you going from a photographer, a f you know, shark aficionado, to going out and speaking to people about shark conservation. Like where did that switch get flipped? Well, I, I guess I noticed over the course of my diving that the reefs didn't look like I remember them mm -hmm. from back in the 80s. Um, they were significantly different and uh, I started to read the literature uh, that's out there about what's going on. And I, I guess at some point uh, in the not too far past, I, I thought, well, wait a minute, Bill, why don't you do something about it rather than just reading about mm -hmm. it? So uh, that was when I really determined that I was going to try to do something about it. So uh, that's what dr drove me forward. So at that point, did you reach out to other people, or what? Yeah, well, I started to talk to people that were involved in, uh, you know, trying to save sharks, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I made it clear I didn't know much about what I was going to talk about or whatever, but they were very, very happy to tell me as much as I wanted to hear. Fantastic. And, and, uh, and now I've started to become one of them. Uh, but I'm not a scientist. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I was saying to Jenny, like, God help me if somebody says, what's the Latin name for that? Because <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't tell you. But, uh, but I think I'm doing my little bit with my mom and pop operation here. And you know, hopefully I can bring things forward. Well, you're very much inspiring all of us here, for Thank sure. You. And part of the reasons for kind of picking away at that question is like, some of us are here taking cliff notes. Good. You know, <laughs> on process. So. You had a question here also, I think. Yes. So, so I, I asked about the shark lips and everything. So, like, are there any species that you haven't dived in that you would like to see uh, Well, uh, this is silly, but I have not. Well, the question is, uh, are there any species of sharks I have not dived with yet? And uh, that would be a whale shark, of all <laughs> things. And uh, I'm hoping to make that happen. Oh, we can uh, fix very that. Very soon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been diving in places where they're supposed to be, but again, the old you're not in a zoo thing, and I, I came up blank on it. So that is really one of the sharks I'd really, really like to see a lot. Um, outside of that, uh, any shark that comes down the path, I, I like. I, I just love the look of them. Um, this recently, I was diving with um, uh, brown sharks off of uh, Florida, and I've seen them at a distance. For the first time, they came in real close, and uh, boy, they were just beautiful. Mm. Uh, I love the dorsal fins on those sharks, and so. Uh, and actually, a week before this is in June, uh, the week before I went out on one of these dives, a great white did come by the other divers that I was with, and I remember somebody commented. He said, "Let me see," because there were probably eight photographers in the water. And I said, let me see, there's probably $50,000 worth of camera gear in the water and nobody got a picture of the great white, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can tell you from my own experience awesome. as a ship pilot, one time I got off a ship and there was a whale 
breaching right by the pilot boat. So I got my camera out and I told the pilot boat to follow the whale. And I'm standing there on the, the bow of the pilot boat and suddenly this whale comes out of the water and completely breached out of the water. And Bill Band's reaction was, holy shit! You know, and, and, and then I got a photograph of a, a splash and a little piece of fin. You know? <laughs> and uh, so that's probably what happened to those guys, you know. So that's awesome. Love it. I love it. Well, is there any other questions that anybody has? You, yes. The question is uh, taking steps towards conservation in their everyday life. Um, well, uh, ashore, I would start uh, carrying your own bags to the grocery store. Um, think about plastics. Um, avoid, uh, if you're onshore, that could very well end up in the ocean somewhere. And you know, what happens with this stuff is that uh, I had this vision that there was a big, like, toilet bowl thing in the Pacific with all this plastic, but what happens is that plastic actually breaks down into microscopic particles, and, uh, and that's what's poisoning the fish and whatnot. So make sure that the area around you is clean and, and be conscious of it. Remind your friends. Uh, don't be afraid to put a sign up about picking up your own trash and and uh, how important it is. Then find something that you like that you think needs protecting and, and act on it. That's what I would do. Even if it's a, in little steps, so long as you know that you're taking care of that. Great so. advice. Great advice. Anybody else? Any other burning questions? Thoughts? <laughs> one more. This is the last one. Yes. Okay. So what's like the most unique shark that you've ever caught? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah she's, she's a doll. Uh, to me, I, I think it's the great hammerheads. I, I just I love the look of those animals, and um, they, uh, they can get up to 20 feet in length. I've never seen one quite that big, but uh, when they come in, uh, they, they look like a submarine coming at you. And, uh, um, you probably saw the, with the teeth and everything, and they're just, oh, you have? Well, good for you. Good for you. Yeah, and that's probably, of all the sharks, certainly my favorite, and I could see them repeatedly and feel just as excited every time, so. Yeah. I think my, my favorite picture was probably that great hammer in profile where you can see that dorsal. Yeah, Because it's Thank also... You. Probably my favorite species. Yeah, it's yeah. A great, no, they're great, so great impressive. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you again for being thank here you. and speaking to us and inspiring us and sharing with us your beautiful photographs <laughs> and wonderful stories. It's been such a delightful evening. Thank you all of you for thank being you. here this evening. I have a few housekeeping things, so I'm going to get my list here. Um, we do have two more lectures coming up in 2018. The first one is coming up on November 6th, so for that one, please go vote first, and then join us here. Um, we will have Roz Savage, who is a solo ocean rower, and then on December 4th, we will be welcoming Gina McCarthy, who is 13th Administrator of the EPA. Um, and, but more immediately, we have International Sawfish Day, so a flat shark coming October 17th, which is next Wednesday, um, International Sawfish Day, this is the second year that it is in existence, and that this new holiday is in existence in part due to one of our um, aquarists here, uh, fishes research specialist, Alan Henningsen, who's been here for many, many years, and he, along with um, a small handful of people around the globe, have gotten together to create International Sawfish Day. So we will be celebrating that here at the aquarium and having some activities for guests up in the Harbor View Room. So we're very excited about that. Um, so for the, those who don't know about the flat shark species, the, the sawfish in particular, there are five species, and they are, um, some of them are critically endangered, others less so, but because they're so hard to tell apart, one of the smartest things they did regulation-wise is they made them all 
under the same auspices. So they are all getting the same amount of protection. Um, and believe it or not, there are some of them in Florida, out in like Jupiter, people doing research on them. They are the most incredible thing. Look on YouTube and look at like a baby sawfish being born. It's unbelievable. Um, sorry, just my moment to geek out here. Um, <laughs> So for more information on the lectures, you can always go to aqua.org slash lecture. You can find more information on the series as well as watching previous lectures that have been giving. Um, and if you're on our, e our mailing list, then you will get the most current updates. So as soon as the updates come out, you'll get those immediately. And if you want to sign up for those, you can just go to aqua.org and get on that mailing list. Um, it has been such a delight having you here and such a wonderful time to get to meet you and hear all your stories. So thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks thank Jenny. you all for being here. Have a wonderful night.